Okay, we're going to talk about Vajrayana, which is Tibetan Buddhism. Few scholars will tell you that Vajrayana is simply a subset of Mahayana. Uh, others will say, no, Vajrayana is distinct enough it should be considered a third vehicle, along with the Hinayana, or lesser vehicle, the smaller vehicle, uh, Mahayana, the, the greater vehicle, larger vehicle, and Vajrayana. Where I stand on that is, what difference does it make? <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's something to interest scholars, not practitioners. So, <clears throat> Vajra, actually the word Vajra refers to an ancient weapon, which was uh, used to penetrate, penetrate armor, penetrate, uh, you know, thick surfaces. It was shaped like a thunderbolt, and usually made of some indestructible, if you will, very difficult to destroy material, and hence sometimes uh, simply referred to as diamond, although it wouldn't have literally been made out of diamonds. So the Vajrayana is sometimes called the, uh, the th path of the thunderbolt path or the uh, diamond path. It is essentially the path of energy. There are three elements that combine in Vajrayana. They are the Mahayana, Tantra, and Pern. I know that's spelled B-O-N, but that's the way uh, Westerners began transliterating it. Tibetans will all tell you that it's pronounced Pern, and indeed uh, Fisher in your textbook uh, notes that it's pronounced Pern. So all I can say is sometimes that happens. So what are the, uh, what are the most important features of Tibetan Buddhism? Well, Tibetan Buddhism, first of all, is only a small part of the picture of the historical development of Buddhism. Okay? Um, it has a disproportionate amount of attention given its place in, in the history of Buddhism by Westerners, and that's simply because of, uh, largely because of the Dalai Lama and because of other teachers uh, who came to America when, uh, when Beijing, when, uh, when China invaded Tibet and uh, teachers went into exile, okay, now because we were exposed to them, and many of them were extraordinarily good teachers. Uh, there's a lot of interest in, in Tibetan Buddhism. This is historically a drop in the bucket, but you know, every drop is, is precious. Okay, Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva goal, the being who is uh, dedicated to the uh, enlightenment of all other beings, who practices for the sake, not a personal enlightenment, but for the sake of the enlightenment of all beings, who dedicates his life to other beings. That, of course, you've seen before in the Mahayana. And uh, actually that goes all the way back, you know, to the earliest strata of Buddhism. And that's very important in the Vajrayana. The Dalai Lama has sometimes noted how if China had not invaded Tibet, uh, he would have spent a great deal of time uh, meditating, doing marathon meditation and study and so forth. Uh, and instead, he's going around the world teaching people, participating in seminars and workshops and festivals and so forth to promote peace and compassion. And he said, this is, a, in, in a sense, he has to, see how tantric this sounds, he has to see the Chinese invasion and occupation as brutal and as, as, as awful as it has been. He has to see that as something that has a positive element too because in driving him and other teachers out of Tibet, they were able to better fulfill their bodhisattva vows in taking the teachings of compassion and, and wisdom to the entire world. So, I uh, had a friend, a professor, who met the Dalai Lama personally back in the 1970s when it was, let's say, a far more rare occurrence for a Westerner to meet the Dalai Lama. And I asked him, well, what was your, what was your impression of the Dalai Lama? And he said, I expected to meet someone who would seem to be like the Buddha, and what I actually met was someone who treated me as if I were the Buddha. And we were thinking at the time, wow, that's, uh, <laughs> that's probably the best thing you could have said. Literally, everyone is the Buddha. So that's so much a part of this path. Practice includes ceremonies, chanting, mudras, art, music, 
all kinds of things, dance, all kinds of things that you would associate with, uh, with Tantra but not with a more traditional Buddhism. Everything can be a tool to lead you toward enlightenment. Ritual as meditation, we saw that uh, again with Tantra, ritual as meditation. Confucius, we'll see later, says that ritual is one of the most important things we can, can engage in, provided we engage in it with the proper attitude, with the proper mentality. Empty rituals are worthless. Well, here, ritual is actually meditation. Okay. This is an accelerated path, a path of energy, again, the tantric influence, and it's esoteric. You don't want people trying to learn Tibetan Buddhism just because they're mildly curious or because they have some sort of essentially egocentric goal rather than this bodhisattva goal. Otherwise, you're going to pollute or distort or diminish the path. And then what? Again, the way of, uh, the way, this is not because, this is not a way of locking the door and saying, you know, you've got to know the secret handshake to learn Vajrayana. It's more like, you know, you've got to be serious about it. You've got to really want to do it, okay? Uh, and so you have to have a guru, you have to have a lineage of teachers, you have to get serious about this if you really want to learn it. Does that mean you can't learn anything from Tibetan Buddhism unless you're going to go 100% into it? No, no, of course not. Of course not. There are various tools that Tibetan Buddhists have tried to uh, teach, particularly in the West, as you can use this no matter who you are. In fact, the Dalai Lama is um, noted for often saying, I don't want you to become a Buddhist. I want you to simply become more who you are, a more compassionate and wise version of who you are. And he has been known to also remind people, remember the Buddha was not a Buddhist. Another important part of the Vajrayana is deity practice. Again, the deities are seen as spiritual principles. Actually, uh, at the highest level of understanding, they are projections of our own consciousness. They are aspects of our own consciousness. Um, you, in selecting a deity that is going to be the center of your devotional practice, your body becomes the body of the deity. That is the, the worldly manifestation of the spiritual principle. If the principle is compassion, then your body you begin to see as the physical manifestation of compassion. And that should alter how you act, and how you experience your life. Your world becomes this spiritual dimension that's portrayed oftentimes in a yantra or in some sort of, some sort of art, artistic work like a yantra. Tankas, they're sometimes called. This, is, this, is, this world is the world of enlightenment. This world is the Buddha realm if you can penetrate the illusion and see what it really is. Enjoyments, the enjoyments of life, you begin to see those as being the enjoyments of the, of the deity. Enjoyments of the deity, well, you know, in the West we talk about, you know, God loves people, God is pleased by this, God is pleased by that. We talk about God's, God in anthropomorphic terms within the uh, Abrahamic traditions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. And in the pagan traditions, you know, the gods were anthropomorphic. So we, we, we know what it means to speak of the gods being pleased or the gods, you know, being happy or whatever. Our enjoyments in our life we begin to experience as being, the, again, the living manifestation of the principle of compassion, the principle of wisdom, the principle of whatever it is that that deity represents. It's interesting, we, uh, as often noted, when we talk about deities in the West, particularly when in the, in, say, in the Christian tradition talking about God, you can see God as Father, and uh, in many flavors of the Western traditions, you see God as Mother. In Hinduism, you also see uh, you know, God as Child. Well, I think I mentioned in one of the lectures on Hinduism, Christians can understand that, you know, once a year you talk about the baby Jesus. Right? You love God as you would love a child. In Hinduism, in Tantra in particular, you also love God as lover. Now that, most, most Westerners, because of our attitudes towards sexuality, would uh, feel an immediate uh, revulsion at that. Wait a minute, God as lover? What are you talking about? That's, that's weird. No, 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 not at all. Think of lover as that person to whom you feel most close, 
most intimate, most open, who brings joy and fulfillment and meaning to your life, uh, gee, <laughs> well, why wouldn't you experience the deity that way? The myths of Krishna and his lover Radha, Shiva and Shakti, Rama and Sita, all explore elements of what it is to be lover and beloved. Okay, so enjoyments, yeah, it's clear, it's clear. We can experience our enjoyments, if you will, as the enjoyments of the deity. Bodhicitta, okay, that is the enlightened mind, the wisdom mind, our everyday thoughts, our everyday feelings and desires and so forth can be understood as manifestations of this wisdom mind, the mind of the deity, if you will, okay? Uh, if we see through them, you remember we talked about interdependent origination in early Buddhism? How does this feeling, how does this perception, how does this desire, how does this aversion, how does this whatever arise instantaneously? Everything we experience can be spiritual teacher if, we, if it is illustrating to us how that mind works, how attachment works, and how liberation from attachment works. Okay? A few terms that you probably have run into 101 times. Lama. The term Lama is used frequently simply to mean a revered teacher. Okay, oftentimes the head of a monastery. Tolku is a reincarnated Lama. We say reincarnated, remember in Buddhism that's different from in, uh, from in Hinduism. In Hinduism, if you're a reincarnated whatever, you are literally, it's the same, it's the same Atman who has uh, been remanifested. In Buddhism, there isn't a permanent essential self, there isn't an Atman, there is this continuity, there is this stream. If I light a candle, use a candle to light another candle, and as soon as this one gets lit, this one goes out, is that flame the same flame? Not exactly. Is it a different flame? Not exactly. But there's a continuity between the two. So this is a remanifestation, if you will, of that stream of continuity that was formerly a llama in a previous life, okay? A Rinpoche, the, the word means something like actually precious. Rinpoche is a revered teacher, may or may not be a tolku, but very often is also a tolku, okay? So when you hear someone called lama or tolku or Rinpoche, those are simply terms that are, that are applied to various Tibetan teachers. They're not something that you necessarily have to worry about, okay? Well, gee, he's only a Lama, but he's a Rinpoche. I wonder if that Rinpoche is also a Tolku. Well, I gotta figure out who I should listen to. No, you find the teacher who works for you and the teachings that work for you, okay? Of course, the Dalai Lama is the first person people think about when they, when they hear about, when they hear Tibetan Buddhism or even Tibet. The Dalai Lama, this is a position that is only um, a few centuries old, I believe about 800 years old. This does not go back a thousand years or you know, to very ancient times. Tibet went through all kinds of political transformations and cultural transformations over the, over the ages. The position of the Dalai Lama, Dalai means ocean, we sometimes refer to as ocean of wisdom. Um, the Dalai Lama is the head of one school of Tibetan Buddhism. Okay? Now also tr by tradition, he is the secular leader. Of, of Tibet. Since the Chinese invasion, uh, he is, although the United States still treats him as a head of state in exile, uh, he has no actual political control in, in Tibet. The way things work is that, uh, okay, Dalai Lama is supposed to be a tolku using astrology and various other things that are actually part of the, of the Pern tradition. Um, Various lamas and oracles, bonpos, or you know, practitioners of Pern, would seek out who had reborn, been reborn, who was, you know, what child born at a particular time, particular locations, might be the, you know, the reborn, the reborn previous Dalai Lama. And they have various tests that they'll give the child. You know, here are, you know, twenty malas. You know what a mala is, right? 20 malas that look more or less identical, 20 pairs of eyeglasses, 20 bowls, whatever. 
pick out the ones that belong to the previous Dalai Lama. And the child just simply picks them out and says, these are mine. Then, okay, well, this person's recognizing the stuff that belonged to the previous Dalai Lama. It's evidence, along with the astrological evidence, that this is the, uh, that this is the, uh, the rebirth of the, of the previous Dalai Lama. And then that child is trained from an early age to be the new Dalai Lama. What happens when the Dalai Lama dies? It's the Panchan Lama, who is basically the, the second highest ranking Lama in the, the Gulag school of, uh, of Tibetan Buddhism. Dalai Lama is the highest ranking, Panchan Lama is the second highest ranking. The Panchan Lama decides which of the possible new incarnations is actually the Dalai Lama. Okay? And then when the Panchan Lama dies, it's the Dalai Lama who chooses which of the possible candidates is actually the rebirth of the Panchan Lama. And so there's this reciprocal process that goes on. And it's you know, not that many centuries old. Now, the current Dalai Lama identified the uh, rebirth of the, you know, the, uh, a young boy who's the rebirth of the Panchan Lama. And pretty much immediately, uh, the Chinese government kidnapped the child along with the child's parents. They've never been heard from again. The Chinese said, essentially, religion is nonsense. This is a purely political appointment, and because Tibet is a province of China, and uh, you know, Beijing has the right to pick out who's the new Panchan Lama, and they installed their own, their own guy, who's essentially there to do the bidding of, of, of Beijing. Some people have called him the youngest political prisoner in the world, but unfortunately, I'm not even sure that that's true. So what's going to happen when the current Dalai Lama dies? Will the Panchan Lama find his successor? Well, this is Beijing's guy, right? <laughs> so they'll just appoint whoever they like. Beijing will predictably just appoint whoever they like as the new Dalai Lama. The current Dalai Lama has said, he's, he's, he's a very playful person, he has said, but very sincere, I mean, those two can go together. He has said, I may be reborn as a woman in the West. He has said, okay, I've given instructions to my, to my retinue that they will find me, not in Tibet, but in a Western democracy. And he's also said, you know what, there may not be another Dalai Lama after me because the role of the Dalai Lama was created to fulfill certain functions that were relevant at one time, and they might not be relevant now. In other words, no attachment to this notion that there must be a Dalai Lama. If it's useful, it'll happen. If it's not useful to people, no one will care whether it happens, and so it won't. The Dalai Lama is in his 80s now, so of course, we'll probably find out <laughs> before too many more years that, uh, you know, exactly how this whole tradition will be handled or whether it will, will be maintained at all. At the core of the Vajrayana is the notion of transformation. We are always in a bardo state. A bardo state is a, straight, a state of change and transformation. We're always in a bardo state. Every moment is a bardo state. The Tibetan Book of the Dead, as it's called, which is actually a book about uh, about rebirth and consciousness and the liberation of consciousness. Um, this is about you know, the bardo, you know, the great bardo of liberation. You have a chance to become fully liberated. And if you don't, here's what's going to happen. Okay, but every moment we're in a bardo state. Now we are fortunate that uh, actually a film that I usually show, I, class when I did this as a face-to-face -face class, The Tibetan Book of the Great Liberation. That film is now available online, so you'll find it linked. And if you watch that, that will actually cover a lot of ground that otherwise I would have to be covering in lecture, but it will do it in a visually much more interesting way. Fierce deities, pay particular attention to that. Fierce deities, what are the fierce deities? Those demonic looking things. Those are uh, images, and many, many, many of them taken from the Pern tradition, but they've been made our friends. You know what? When I become angry with someone, that's a hostile, destructive energy. But if I have the proper frame of mind, I'll see my anger arising, and I'll be able to say to myself, this is how I become angry, and this is how I suffer because of my anger. 
And here's how I can change that, how I can transform that. If I understand the fierce deities, the negative, if you will, frames of mind, to all be manifestations of my own mind, they can all become my teachers. That doesn't mean make a fetish out of being angry. <laughs> what that means is, rather than feeling like, oh, I have to pretend I'm not angry, I have to repress it or whatever, what I really need to do is sort of get underneath it and see how does that happen. And then it is teaching me how to liberate, how to become liberated. Tonglen, um, there are people who say that if you haven't taken a very extensive amount of training in Tibetan Buddhism, you can't practice Tonglen. There are other people like, uh, for instance, Pema Chandran, who is mentioned in your book. Uh, Pema Chandran, who teaches a variety of Tonglen meditation to everyone. And this is actually based on the story of the Buddha sitting under the bow tree and Mara, the ego, the Lord of Darkness, is firing a multitude of flaming arrows at him, and it's all his own fears, his own aversions, his own this and that and the other thing, vroom, all headed toward him. And he simply, in a gesture of compassion, transformed them all into uh, a gentle shower of lotus petals. Okay, the symbolism there is that all of these destructive elements within me, if transformed by compassion, essentially become you know, the, the shower of wisdom. Okay? Um, briefly, the way that she describes the meditation, you can find this in her book, uh, Awakening Loving Kindness. You don't resist your anger, your fear, your frustration, all these negative things. Rather sort of visualize it. You're sitting in meditation, visualize it as an oily, dark cloud. Draw it all in without resistance. Because if you're, if you're fighting it, you're getting caught up in it. You're making it more real by fighting it. Just draw it all in, and then on your out breath, let it all back out as a shower of golden lotus petals. Okay, again, that reference to the enlightenment of the Buddha. I've trans I'll take it all in, I won't resist it, I won't fight it, I won't make it more real, I will simply embrace it with compassion and allow it to be transformed into wisdom. She teaches something also that is, uh, uh, in teaching Tonglen, that is, um, I think very valuable, but uh, something, that, something that is often misunderstood uh, by Western students, and that is uh, if you are suffering, if you are miserable, if you are in terrible pain, find someone who is also suffering. Identify that person suffering as your own and offer them loving kindness. Do what you can for them. And that transforms your grief into the joy of loving kindness. Um, now, if you, if you attempt to do that and you don't have any kind of a meditation practice to support it, that's very difficult to do. So Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese uh, teacher, said, you know, if you don't have that, if you don't have that well-developed meditation practice, you try to draw upon it to when you have some crisis or some ter terribly negative pain or something, it's like calling up a mosquito to chase away an elephant. Not going to work. You, know, you need to have that, that deep, regular meditation practice to draw upon. Now, this is an absolutely beautiful teaching, uh, and many Westerners are, are drawn to that, and it is you know, firmly rooted within the Tibetan tradition. Eight methods for transforming the mind. That's one of the Dalai Lama's favorite, um, favorite lessons. He's done whole workshop tours based upon uh, the... Uh, eight verses on training the mind. Um, I am by, which is actually by Tsongkhapa, who I mentioned before. Um, I am going to post this document. It will be linked so that you can read it at leisure. But it is so very much about transformation. That I want to read you just a couple parts of it. Tell you a little story first. That same professor I mentioned before went to a workshop being taught by a couple of Tibetan lamas. This is back in the 1970s. Uh, Tibetan Buddhism was much less well known in the West. And he said that most of the people, virtually everyone actually in the workshop was 20 something, white, college educated, middle class. And these two Tibetans began talking about universal compassion. And they said that one way that to 
cultivate universal compassion is to learn to see every being as if it is your mother. So we are going to begin by learning to see every being as your mother. And my friend said, this great collective whining immediately started. Oh, God, no, I don't get along with my mother at all. Oh, I hate my mother, blah, 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 blah. And my friend said, the two llamas looked a little confused. And then they looked like, you're joking, right? And then they both looked terrified, like, oh, my God, I've been locked in a room full of crazy people. At last, one of the, one of the llamas said, you hate your own mother? Well, that's not to say that there are no abusive parents, although I think probably most parents are doing the best they can, the best they understand. But this is it's unbelievable to them. How, this is going to be tougher than we thought. How are we going to work teaching universal compassion to people who hate their own parents? Well, let me just read you a couple of passages here. I will learn to cherish ill-natured beings as those oppressed by strong misdeeds and suffering. In other words, people have a bad nature. What are they going through? What burden are they carrying? As if I had found a precious treasure difficult to find. When others out of jealousy treat me badly with abuse, slander, and so on, I will learn to take all loss and offer the victory to them. When's the last time you did that? Somebody's blowing up at you and you realize, wow, you must be really hurting. Can I do something to address that hurt? Instead of, oh, I'm going to fight back and defend myself, which, of course, escalates, escalates the, the delusion and the suffering. When the one whom I had benefited with great hope unreasonably hurts me very badly, I will learn to view that person as an excellent spiritual guide. So in other words, the people who you think are causing you pain are teaching you the limits of your compassion, the limits of your insight, the limits of your wisdom. They're showing you exactly where you need to do your work. Wow. And then they become your precious teacher. When uh, I saw the Dalai Lama a few years ago, um, he was answering questions that people had submitted in writing. And someone said, what would you say to a young family that's just starting out as, as young children? How could you use your principles to help guide the formation of a family? And the Dalai Lama just burst into laughter and said, you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> because, of course, he's been a monk since he was five years old. But then after he had, he had laughed a little, he said, well, it's just the same principles that you use for everything else. You practice mindfulness, you practice compassion, you practice loving kindness. Okay, and many, many people who do have children have said, our ch your children are your best teachers, your best Dharma teachers, as they teach you exactly where your limits are. They teach you who you really are, not who you like to think you are, but who you really are. So think of that, think of your parents, if you're younger, don't have kids, Think of your parents in that way. You know, your parents are teaching you who you really are because they're teaching you where your limits are. Not who you wish you were, but here are the limits. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Ram Das, the uh, Hindu writer, American Hindu writer, said once, you think you're enlightened? Okay, go home, spend the weekend with your parents. And then on Monday, tell me if you still think you're enlightened. Okay, because, of course, when we have to take our most, our most com complicated relationships and address those in terms of loving kindness, that really shows us, can I, in fact, transform my relationship with compassion, with wisdom, with loving kindness into you know, something of spiritual value? Or do I get just, just get sucked right back into these games of the ego? Okay. Um, so... I think you will enjoy the, uh, the film on the Tibetan Book of the Great Liberation, usually called the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is not really the best title. <laughs> or sometimes it's translated as Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. But there is so much about the nature of the bardo, about transforming negative states into spiritual liberation, about all the things that are so uh, emphatically a part of Tibetan Buddhism that... Uh, it's a very, very good tool for us.